Maddie made her seat last year in the Y Center. There's something wrong with the signal. Or I watched that one on Zoom or the live stream. Hello. Okay. Steadfast comfort to the afflicted mind. Hysteria, gender, and conflict in Alexander Sterling Calder's reclining female nude. Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, hello. Hello, Lily Moyne. Steadfast comfort to the afflicted mind. Okay. Yeah, but it's a weird if I like say in the middle of the sentence. Mm -hmm. Are they all the dots? They're dots, except for right here. It's this blue line. <laughs> but they're, they're her notations. <laughs> um, so have several slide changes quickly, just take your time. Just like at the end of the clause, say next, and then keep continuing. Okay. Next, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Steadfast comfort to the afflicted mind. Hysteria, gender, and conflict in Alexander Sterling Calder's reclining female nude. Okay. Steadfast comfort to the afflicted mind. Hysteria, gender, and conflict is in Alexander Sterling Calder's reclining female nude. Okay. Melanie's last name. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would you like to 
I have to know.
talking about? I'm confused. Well, I think we'll begin. Can you all hear me? <laughs> Welcome. So good evening. Before we get started, we'd like to acknowledge, even in this hybrid format, that the land on which Westover School is built is within the ancestral homelands of the Mohican, Pawgaset, and Wappinger nations who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We acknowledge that Indigenous people do not merely exist in history, but are with us today, and that they continue to endure colonial violence. In our dedication to justice and equity, May we commit ourselves to the long road of reparations and combating the legacy of colonialism and white supremacy through direct action and intentional relationships. So welcome to those of you who are in person. Thank you so much for being here for Lily. And to those of you who are on the live stream, uh, to the 14th annual Sonia Osborne Museum Studies Symposium. As many of you know, this program was created in honor of the passion and commitment of my predecessor, Sonia Osborne, and the many students she inspired through the study of art history in her 20 years here. In honoring Sonia, we set out to create a unique program that provides a student with an opportunity to participate in a comprehensive work study program at Hillstead Museum and to learn art historical scholarship through research projects. Before I introduce Lily, I want to recognize the community of individuals who help make this program possible. It really does take a team of people to support this program. And while Lily will offer her thanks uh, to specific individuals at the conclusion of the presentation, I too would like to say thanks now to all of those individuals at Westover and at Hillstead who've supported this program over the past 14 years. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank the Torrelo family for their generosity in making this internship program possible in the first place. So now I get to say a few words about Lily. So it's been my honor this past year to get to know Lily quite well. Uh, she's not only my senior advisee, but she's taken three classes with me in art history. So we've seen quite a lot of each other. And in working with Lily so closely, I've had the opportunity to get to know how much she leans into the challenge of things. And so I wanted to talk about her willingness to lean into the challenge of things through this symposium writing process. And I'm going to talk about three challenges uh, through my observations. So one, Lily likes to proceed with clear directions and ordered steps. But this is not the way the symposium paper writing process works. Far from it, in fact. This process has no clear prompt. There's no clear direction and there are no clear markers. We have general sort of guidelines and goals, but it's very exploratory. It relies a lot on trust, on trusting the exploration process, on trusting the research you do, um, and trusting me when I promised her that we'd get here tonight. Um, and so throughout that process, Lily showed up prepared and calm and engaged and willing to learn in an entirely new and challenging framework. Uh, and that's pretty remarkable. So two, I think that Lily actually deliberately and secretly seeks out the challenge. As with most interns, students choose a work from Hillstead 
to do their symposium analysis on. And uh, Lily decided to choose one of the most obscure artworks in Hillstead's collection. Uh, there's practically no research on Alexander Sterling Calder at Hillstead, and there's absolutely nothing on the sculpture, right? And the little we could find outside the museum is, was predictable, is that a nice word to say? And quite underwhelming. Um, so Lily leaned into the challenge of being super creative, of finding new paths to explore and applying new arguments to uh, what was relatively an obscure artwork. And then through that all, through all that whole process, she discovered her voice, and that was pretty remarkable. And I'm grateful for your persistence in that. And so the third thing, this is my favorite one, is Lily likes to get straight to her point. She doesn't pass go, she doesn't collect 200, there's no detour. So where I usually find myself helping students simplify and clarify their language, I had the pleasure of doing the opposite with Lily. Right, we got to indulge in words together. We got to discover the rich textures of adjectives that help us find the meaning of the narrative that she was seeking in the argument. Uh, and, and through that process, um, uh, watching Lily talk about something as abstract as a reverie was really fun. So thank you for that. <laughs> so I tell you these moments to underscore just how remarkable Lily is in her willingness to enter a brave space, like the one we're in tonight, and to challenge herself with a new experience. This is the part I get emotional, so excuse me. Okay, and all through the pandemic, we're still living in too. And it should be said that I don't think that Lily's argument, which centers on hysteria and depression, isn't coincidental. <laughs> um, in fact, I think you could take every one of Calder's ruminations on his modern period and substitute pandemic with modernity, and you get something fairly proximal to our current state. Um, so all of this to say is that this process, for me at least, was very healing. And I want to thank you for that, Lily. I want to thank you for learning alongside you and from you, and for all the ways you've inspired me throughout this semester with your perseverance, your effort, and your sense of humor. I hope you're proud not simply of where you are tonight, but all you've done to get to this moment, too. So, okay, I did it. All right, the program will last a little over 30 minutes, after which Lily will take some questions. And with that, please help me in welcoming Lily. Thank you for being here. The SAMSI program has a few components, an internship at Hillstead Museum, the Hillstead Westover Connection Project, and an exploration of a piece of art that is a part of Hillstead's collection. Before I begin my talk on the piece of art, I'd like to take a moment to share about my work on the other two components of SAMSI. Before I began my internship at Hillstead, I did not know what curators or other museum employees did. Through my internship, I was able to experience many of the various roles and responsibilities of museum workers. At Hillstead, I did a lot of recording of objects, writing descriptions for them, and condition reports. On the photo on the left, I'm doing the report for a golden candelabra, and on the right, I'm doing one for a thermos. I also cleaned, so in the middle photo, you can see the bugs I found on <laughs> windowsills. <laughs> I also got to do some conservation work at the museum, which I sadly don't have photos of. I me measured objects and found boxes that would fit them. I also lined some visible drawers in Theodate's closet to show off, two, off a fan and two parasols. And on my last day, I got to help set up the exhibit they have going on right now featuring chairs from both Westover and Avon Old Farms. I definitely learned a lot from my internship at Hillstead. For my Westover Hillstead Connection project, I looked back at Westover's past and reflected on the way we tell the story of our history for an article in the Westover magazine. At the beginning of the semester, I read Lori Lyle's book, Westover, Giving Girls a Place of Their Own, in the first section of the book, Lyle makes a comparison between Westover and Herland, a fictional com utopian community of only women featured in Charlotte Perkins Gilman's novel, Herland. In the article, I take a critical look at how comparing this institution to what seems like a perfect place hurts us rather than helps us, and how instead we should tell a story of imperfections, 
to allow our community to authentically engage with our present so we can grow in the future. Please read it when it comes out in the magazine. For my other project, I chose to take a look at Alexander Sterling Calder's Reclining Female Nude. This sculpture first stuck out to me because of where it is placed at Hillstead. It's above the door leading to the only downstairs bedroom in the second library. When you're walking through the house, it's easy to miss and not notice at all. And I wanted to more deeply explore the female nude after taking my, a woman in art and music class with Alex. And now I'll turn my attention to that project, after which I will take questions and express my gratitude. Steadfast comfort to the afflicted mind. Hysteria, gender, and conflict in Alexander Sterling Calder's reclining female nude. The early 20th century plaster cast reclining female nude by Alexander Sterling Calder shows a woman lying down on her side. With her arms up over her head and her forearms covering her face, the woman guards herself from any disturbance to her reverie. Her back leg is bent and lifted while her front leg disappears dreamily off the plinth. Languid yet protective, vulnerable in her unconsciousness yet wary, the nude arches her back, tensed in reverie, yet escaping into sleep. A student of the realist painter Thomas Aikens, Calder was influenced by the way Aikens captured his modern time in the depressed and anxious portraits of his female sitters. And yet, as Aikens' portraits reveal a kind of hysteria diagnosed in women as a condition of the modern period and potentially read in the pose of Calder's reclining female nude, Calder rests control of the nude through the imposed geometries of classicism demonstrating in the tension of the sculpture both the affliction and the antidote of his modern time, and a desire in the nude's reverie to, as he writes, quote, give, give my old oblivion back, end quote, to comfort what he called the afflicted mind. In aging his female sitters in his portraits, Thomas Aikens, Calder's instructor, depicts the modern condition of depression. In his exploration of gender in Aiken's artwork, William J. Clark, in his article, The Iconography of Gender in Thomas Aiken's Portraiture, argues that Aiken's ages his women to show the social anxieties of his modern time. Aging his women sitters much more than his male sitters, Aiken's, as Clark writes, does so to, quote, communicate a sense of the burden of time, to serve as a visual metaphor for the meaning of entropy and boredom in the lives of many middle-class American women in the late 19th century, end quote. One of his women sitters, Amelia Van Buren, captured by Aikens in both a photograph and a portrait, shows the way in which Aikens' realism captures the gender expectations of women. In the photograph, Van Buren has smooth skin and a youthful look. Leaning forward, she sits perched on the edge of her seat, present and assertive. In her portrait, however, painted in the same year the photograph was taken, Amelia is now wrinkled with gray hair, slouching in her chair, resting her head on her hand. Her lips are pursed in a tight line. Showing her now aged and distant, Aikens portrays Amelia as disconnected from both herself and her reality. This disconnection from reality was a common symptom that was used to diagnose depression and hysteria in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. As Carol Smith Rosenberg argues, women at the turn of the century experienced a, quote, psychophysical decline, end quote, from, quote, isolation, loneliness, and depression, end quote, due to what Smith Rosenberg describes as the, quote, discontinuity between the roles of courted women and pain-bearing, self-sacrificing wife and mother, the realities of an unhappy marriage, the loneliness and chagrin of spinsterhood, end quote. The difficulties of fulfilling the expected roles of wife and mother caused women at the turn of the century to fall into a depression, which Aikens depicts through his sobering female portraits. In aging his female sitters, then, Aikens documents the women of his generation through the condition of depression to capture the social reality of his time. The phenomenon of depression that Aikens was documenting in his female sitters engages with the larger diagnosis of hysteria and the more recent studies that Freud conducted that further affirmed the disconnection of expected gender roles between the active mother and inactive daughter. Derived from the Greek noun hystera, or womb, hysteria is thought by the ancient Greeks to be, 
quote, a neurotic condition peculiar to women and thought to be used by a dysfunction of the uterus, end quote. The Greeks, supported by Plato, the physician Ateus, believed that the roaming uterus theory called hysterical suffocation, causing the uterus to, quote, migrate around the female body, placing pressure on other organs and causing any number of ill effects, end quote. However, in 1880, Jean-Martin Charcot, a French neurologist in the 19th century, seen here on the left, was the first to study hysteria and took a modern scientific look at the female-specific disease, as seen on the photo on the right that shows a representation of hysteria. Sigmund Freud, who further developed Charcot's theories and wrote several studies on female hysteria, most notably his research is shown in a study on hysteria focused on Dora, who, in 1905, manifested hysteria in order to extricate herself from the ideal role she attempted to fill by caring for her sick father. Dora's physical symptoms included bedwetting, vaginal discharge, shortness of breath, migraines, coughing attacks, loss of faculties, and loss of consciousness. While Dora's symptoms demonstrate a kind of hysteria, other symptoms of hysteria as a result of Freud's research included anxiety, depression, irritability, loneliness, boredom, and feeling overburdened. While Freud believed that hysteria came from women being unable to reconcile phallic loss with their fulfillment of marital duties, contemporary scholars have interpreted Freud's studies on Dora, Dora as demonstrative of her inability to reconcile her expected role as caregiver to her father with her role as docile daughter. In her social research, Carol Smith Rosenberg writes about how the conflict of the ideal woman in the 19th century led to the hysterical woman. The ideal daughter, Smith Rosenberg says, quote, was emotional, dependent, and gentle, a born follower, end quote. While she says the ideal mother was, quote, strong, self-reliant, protective, and efficient caretaker in relation to children and home, end quote. While women were expected to be both gentle and dependent, as well as strong-willed and self-reliant, this inactive, active expectation created a conflict. As a result of this conflict for women transitioning between expected roles, social ideals were also changing. Women's control and hard work became more valued, especially as Smith Rosenberg put the quote, women lived longer, they married later and less often, and increasingly took jobs outside the home, end quote. As women were expected to be both active outside the home and inactive inside the home, this inaccessible ideal caused women to be in a constant state of stress, and they were unable to fully realize any of the expectations forced upon them. This tension, be, this tension between being an inactive gentle follower and an active hardworking employed woman ultimately led to a diagnosis of hysteria that demonstrated the social condition of the modern time. If hysteria is able to be recognized as a state of opposition between expected active and inactive roles for women, Calder sculpture can be seen in terms of these oppositional symptoms. The reclining female nude is seen as simultaneously protected with her arms shielding her and defenseless as a nude. She is isolated by the base she is put on, but she breaks the bounds of that base when her leg disappears below it. She is present in the viewer's space, but also a part of another realm as her leg disappears. She is timeless as a nude, decontextualized from the viewer's reality and present in her momentary state. She is, both, she is in both a private state of sleep without consciousness, but she is also public in being viewed. This tension in the reclining female nude between the active state of guarding herself and the passive state of unconsciousness relates back to the tension of the hysterical woman. In addition to these oppositional states, and more symptomatically, her arms block her face from the viewer, which can be reminiscent of the hysterical symptom of lost faculties. Likewise, the nude's eyes are suggested to be closed, a possible reference to the loss of consciousness that accompanies hysteria. While there is no evidence that Calder himself studied hysteria, given the way the sculpture is composed of these states of opposition and symptoms of hysteria, the nude certainly engages with a hysterical dialect. Just like the nude he created evoking hysteria, Calder demonstrated a similar sense of anxiety toward the modern world. 
Calder hated the modern world, and in, his, in the book, Thoughts of E. Sterling Calder on Art and Life, a collection of writings by Calder published posthumously by his wife in 1947, he does not hide it. He writes that, quote, sculpture reflects in subject, in the choice of subject and treatment of the spirit of our time. It is ugly because our age is ugly, the gasoline age of noise and stink, end quote. In reflecting on the ugliness of the world, Calder continues throughout the book describing the effects of modernity as hate, greed, and envy, as irritation, as groaning, and as toil. In another section of the book, Calder asks, quote, what is beauty? There is no beauty. Everything is grotesque, end quote. As modernity then to Calder is a world that is irritating, ugly, noisy, stinky, and grotesque, sourcing his anxieties, art is his cure. He writes, quote, life yearns for a respite from the driving cares of time that know no rest, unless by gentle art beguiled to make believe that what we wish is true, end quote. For Calder, gentle art must beguile to bring back the oblivion that eases this suffering and provides distance from the modern age. He writes, quote, O oh God, O oh dog, O oh something powerful that summoned me to life, that planted me just the ability, I have to cope with life and not enough to cope joyfully. What makes me suffer for your lack? Give, give my old oblivion back. In his poem, Calder describes how awful it is that he has been given and has to cope with his modern life, and all he is reaching for is oblivion. This oblivion, the distance that art provides, cures the pain that society has left him and becomes the antidote for his modern condition. Although he saw the modern world as suffering, the remedy of oblivion, the distance provided by art, was accomplished for Calder through a classical ordering. Having been taught in the classical style at the Philadelphia Art School, especially in relation to the nude sculpture, Calder describes the antidote to modernity as, quote, based frankly on needs, then made beautiful in our own kind, with all deference to the Greeks and to the Italians. I admire them and their work so much that I want to penetrate into their minds, to learn the moods of life that compelled them these admirable creations, end quote. With Calder's need to shelter in the classical past, he was influenced by his instructor Aikens, who despite being a realist, wanted to move art into the modern world, doing so on the basis of these classical foundations. In Martin Berger's Modernity and Gender, in Thomas Aikens' Swimming, the work which is seen here, Berger writes that Aikens used the classical foundation to further the modern choice he made when crafting his own art. Featuring nude male swimmers standing on ruins, Berger writes that Aikens' style, as seen in swimming, was, quote, anchored by the solid foundations of the past. Aikens' students symbolically appear on the threshold of modern artistic practice, while their teacher, seen on the bottom right swimming, swims alone in the deep water far from the traditional foundations of conventional American art. The students present varying states of readiness to follow their mentor, end quote. While Aikens brings his students with him into the realism of the modern age, quote, anchored by the solid foundations of the past, end quote, Calder laments the loss of this classical idealism. He writes, quote, we cannot go back to the golden age. We must and will go forward to find a new way of life when the emphasis is put on things that really matter. The world is groping for it, end quote. As Calder suffers from the lack of his modern age and its distance from the order and knowing of the classical period, he feels loss and needs the remedy for his anxieties, classical idealism, a remedy that can be seen in the reclining female nude. While her, with her arm up covering her face, shielding herself from the world around her, she guards against the reality of her modern time by retreating into her reverie. Indeed, even the medium of the plaster cast, according to Howard Roberts, a late 19th century sculptor from Philadelphia, denotes death in the sculptural cycle in its impermanent and intermediary state between clay model and bronze cast. The nude thus, both in her unconscious state and in the transitory phase of her sculptural medium, denotes loss. 
while Calder desires to create with the classical ideals of the past, which he believes is the remedy and antidote for the modern world, he regulates the woman he sculpts in the reclining female nude. In Linda Nude's book, The Female Nude, Art, Obscenity, and Sexuality, she writes that the female body through art, quote, has to undergo a process of containment, end quote, quote, a framing, end quote, end quote, remorseless discipline, end quote. Need writes, quote, if the female body is defined as lacking containment and issuing filth and pollution from its faltering outlines and broken surfaces, then the classical forms of art perform a kind of magical regulation on the female body, containing it and momentarily repairing the orifices and tears, end quote. This reordering is a way of depicting the female nude in terms of classical proportioning and imposed geometries. As such, while the reclining female nude denotes loss in her pose and medium, she is governed by the classical ordering elements of symmetry. As her bent leg mirrors her bent arm and her relaxed arm mirrors her relaxed leg, she is reclining in a kind of classical contraposto that orders her body in proportional dynamic symmetry. Important to Calder then is this ordering of the female nude, his remedy of imposed classicism as a way for him to control the modern world. What the reclining female nude reveals then, in addition to the condition of the modern period through her hysteria and the remedy of the classical ordering to regulate such change, is a hypermasculine assertion of control in response to modernity. Julian Bowles, in his 1925 review of Calder's work, describes Calder's sculptures as, quote, towering form in the present day art world, simple, virile, poignant, rich in learning, end quote championing called their sculptures as being, quote, simple and, quote, virile, against the present day. Bowles elevates Calder's work for upholding classical principles by writing that his work is, quote, exalted to heights not achieved since the Greeks in his work, end quote. By elevating Calder's work as the height of modern classicism and by calling Calder's work virile, Bowles affirms the hypermasculinity and control of Calder's regulation of the female nude. Even Calder himself described the urge to penetrate the Greek mind in a hypermasculine expression of possession. Further, such hypermasculinity can be seen in the way Calder sculpted Dr. Samuel Gross, an American trauma surgeon in the 19th century. Calder's sculpture of Dr. Gross seen here serves as a monument and depicts Gross standing looking beyond and above the viewer. His hand is raised as if he were in mid-thought, pontificating while standing in absolute understanding and knowing. Aiken similarly depicted the surgeon in his 1875 painting, The Gross Clinic, where Dr. Gross is shown performing clinical instruction on surgery. Just as Aikens depict Dr. Gross with a highlighted forehead demonstrating Gross's reason and greatness, both artists emphasize the patriarchy by lifting up Gross whether that be by highlighting his forehead or literally putting him on a pedestal. Despite the similarities, however, Aikens represents both the hypermasculinity and hysteria in his work, separating the manly reason from female hysteria through the depiction of the female family member featured on the left of the painting. In the red circle. Through the fainting female spectator, much like Calder's nude, she covers her eyes by holding her arm up and leans away from the surgery. While Aikens emphasizes the dialectic between male reason and female hysteria, Calder eliminates the female spectacle by showing only the patriarchy of medicine and reason in a sole representation of Dr. Gross. Such emphasis on the intellectual capability of Dr. Gross aligns with Calder's view of sculpture as a hypermasculine medium in its physicality. He writes, quote, sculpture is an intellectual sport, which is expressed in physical forms. It should naturally in our climate be our national outdoor intellectual sport, end quote. Aligning sculpture to physical outdoor sports resonates not only with the male antidote to hysteria, which was, quote, vigorous outdoor exercise, end quote, but also the competitive nature of male sports in the early 20th century. Even Aikens, according to Randall C. Griffin in his article, Thomas Aikens' Construction of the Male Body, depicted men as, quote, 
highly competitive, end quote, participating in, quote, particularly manly activities as wrestling, boxing, rope pulling, and rock throwing, end quote. On the left is an image of Aiken's students wrestling for the purpose of Aiken's recording the human body in motion. As sculpture becomes Calder's own manly intellectual sport, the sculpture cast as a medium becomes both the symptom, death and loss, and the cure, physical sport, emphasizing remedy through art as hyper-masculine control to order the modern time. The reclining female nude references the hysteria of the modern period while offering a remedy through the hyper-masculine control of classicism. Finding solace in the art, Calder writes, quote, passionately, the time-worn sculpture wrestles with his phantoms, to wrest from them the meaning of this life of ours, to somehow pierce the veil of baffling mystery that shroud us all about, and bend the rebellious spirit to acceptance, that from weltering chaos may emerge images of steadfast comfort to the afflicted mind, end quote. Embodying both the phantom, the rebellious spirit, the baffling mystery of Calder's modern age in the hysteria-riddled tensions of the nude's form and the acceptance, the meaning, and steadfast comfort of its classical ordering, the reclining female nude demonstrates both the affliction and the antidote. This conflict in the sculpture then can be seen can be read as Calder actively resting the rebellious modern spirit in a very physical, hyper-masculine way from the inert cast to revive modern comfort in the afflicted mind. Thank you. like figuring out how the argument would like in go in order and what actually fit into my argument and what I had to leave out even if I thought it was really interesting. Yeah. Um, I like that it was sort of like tucked away but and like very ambiguous but I think it still had like a story to tell and I wanted to know what that story was. the painter. Um, what is something really fascinating that you found out in your research that you were unable to share with us today? Um, I read this article about how we touch sculpture with our eyes um, and didn't end up fitting into the hysteria argument, but I think it's a really interesting concept. Were you able to share any of this with the docents at the museum, and if so, how did they respond? I'm imagining that they've walked by it so many times and then you had something so interesting to, to share. Um, I haven't shared it with them, so. <laughs> What did you learn most about yourself through this very long process? I think that I learned that I need to be okay with not having structure all the time and that it's okay to like live in the ambiguous sure things. <laughs> Yeah. 
Thank you. Lily, that was amazing. Um, I'm curious if you came across any other sculptures by this artist in your research. Yeah. And, um, and, and I'm just curious about what some of those other topics were that were sculpted. Um, he did another monument like the Dr. Gross, and he also did a lot of um, like mythology scenes. The only proper way to end is with thank you and appreciation for the people who helped me get to this point. First and foremost, a huge thank you to Allie for introducing me to art history, helping me find my passion, giving me this amazing opportunity to study art, explore career opportunities, and push myself as a student and public speaker. Um, thank you, Allie. Um, I'd like to thank Jess Tabak, who not, not only for teaching me how English works, but also for being a sounding board on me from everything from my article to book. I want to thank Melanie Bourbeau, Halestead's curator, for in introducing me to museum careers and providing me such an enriching internship experience. I'd like to thank Giselle for allowing me to help out in the archives and helping me find all the information I needed. Uh, I'd like to thank Mary Head for publishing my article and supporting me through the process. I'd like to thank Alyssa for setting up transportation for me every week. I'd like to thank Dante for conferencing with me about my Herland Westover article. I'd like to thank Tech for setting up the live stream and the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank the incredible Westover faculty, faculty who have had my back for years, teaching me, supporting me, encouraging me, and believing in me. I'd like to thank my dad for inspiring me and getting me one of the copies of father's book from the Yale Library. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank my mom for cheering me on and listening to my stressed tears. I'd like to think we're done with those, but probably not. And I'd finally like to thank all of you for allowing me to share my Somsi experience. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.